Welcome everyone to the Medspiration Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nav, and this is episode number 16 with Dr. Bruce Lipton. I know heaven is a mind state. I've been a couple times stuck in my way, so I keep on falling down. The science I'm going to present can change your life with this science you can create the most wonderful life on this planet the secret i found out is first part is to know to have the the knowledge but the second part is the most important and that part is you must actually use the science in your life or it doesn't work When you look in a mirror and see yourself and you see like one person looking back, it's, that is not true. You are made out of 50 trillion cells and the cells are the living entities. So you are a community, not a single person. But your mind is the government for the 50 trillion cells. Every cell in your body has a minus voltage on the inside and positive voltage on the outside. Every live cell is a battery. Every cell has about 1.4 volts, not too much. 50 trillion cells in the body times 1.4 volts is 700 trillion volts of electricity in your body right now. And with training and meditation, you can focus this energy called Qi. And you can use that energy for healing. So the energy in your body is a vital force. So the new science brings back the old story of vital forces controlling life. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're having a blessed day. Thank you so much for pressing play and tuning into the Medspiration podcast where our goal is to help you bridge the gap between medical science and your mind, body, and spirit. In today's episode, we're bringing you one of the founding fathers of stem cell biology and human genetic engineering. Dr. Bruce Lipton was doing research on stem cells more than 50 years ago, back when only a handful of scientists even knew what they were. He received a PhD degree in developmental cell biology from the University of Virginia, and his research at Stanford University School of Medicine revealed that the environment we put our cells into controls their behavior and physiology, and this process can allow our cells to turn on and off specific genes. His findings have went on to contribute and help create one of today's most important fields of study, the science of epigenetics. That's why in today's episode, we're going to be dissecting Dr. Bruce Lipton's revolutionary work and giving practical tips on how he teaches his clients to reprogram their mind in a way that helps them maximize their full cellular and genetic potential. Bruce's teachings now reach millions of people each week as he's gained a huge following on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Being able to connect with him is living proof to me that dreams can come true because this man's work literally was the main reason why I began falling in love with medicine and discovering the power of the human mind. It's truly been an honor and privilege to connect with some of my biggest heroes with an intention to share high quality science with you, our audience. If you'd like to add to this conversation, please message or tag us on Instagram. The handle is at Medspiration. And if you've been enjoying this content, ladies and gentlemen, please, Subscribe to our podcast and go and rate it five stars on iTunes. Leave a review and let us know which parts of our episodes you enjoy most. It really would mean the entire world to our team. And now, without further ado, let the Medspiration begin. Dr. Bruce Lipton, welcome to the Medspiration podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce one of my greatest Medspirations, He's an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit, and his work has truly helped me transition my philosophies as a budding physician. 
Dr. Lipton, if you wouldn't mind, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Well, uh, Nev, I, I just I want to thank you and I want to thank your audience out there because this is a time of awakening. You know, this is a time that uh, all that chaos that you see going on is a recognition of an unfolding, uh, a coming down of a current civilization and the building of a new one. So uh, I want to uh, say how happy I am to be with you, Nav, and with your audience because I consider them the cultural creatives. Those people that are seeking answers, and I, I have deepest appreciation for you to step out and uh, and widen the scope of what conventional medicine is all about, because it's necessary to adapt to a new understanding, and especially with quantum physics that we might be talking about. Oh, yeah. So thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I know we have some really exciting things to uh, talk about on the show, Nav. Yes, sir. In honor of, of this conversation, I, I wanted to share my journey and how i came across your work so absolutely i was in my first year of medical school and i came across your research on stem cells and epigenetics and it was literally at that very moment i knew that the contributions i would dream of making to medicine it would come from the mind body spirit philosophy flash forward six years later medspiration exists and our philosophy is mind body spirit i really want to start by discussing your research, I know it's like 45, 50 years ago now, the stem cell research, but it is one of the most groundbreaking findings that I ever discovered from you. So could you please share that with our audience? Yeah, uh, very basically this, when I was uh, back there, oh my God, 50, oh my, it's over 50 years, sorry. Uh, yeah. I was uh, cloning stem cells, and back in those days, there was only a handful of us in the whole world that knew what a stem cell was, so it's a small group. I was cloning them, which meant I put one single stem cell in a culture dish by itself, and then it would divide every 10 or 12 hours, and then start with 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, doubling 30,000 cells in the Petri dish after one week. Wow. But the most important understanding of this so far is that all the cells came only from one parent. So that meant I had 30,000 genetically identical cells in that Petri dish. A uh, little sidebar, what, what the heck are stem cells? Let's, let's clear that up yeah, right away. Yeah. Uh, the simple fact a, a body is not a single entity it's made out of 50 trillion cells every cell is an individual living sentient being so to speak but every day we lose hundreds of billions of these cells natural attrition uh, skin is, shuff, is sloughing off uh, we replace the digestive tract lining oh i guess nearly a trillion cells every three days yep. and i say well uh, look at this uh, story here. Uh, we have 50 trillion cells and we're losing hundreds of billions of every day. And it's like, well, how long can you live if you keep losing hundreds of billions of cells? Uh, and the answer is not very long. But the idea is, well, how come we are still here? And the answer is because when we were born, embryonic cells that were with us in the, in the womb stay with us after we're born. Uh, and an embryonic cell is multipotential. Uh, but you can't call it an embryonic cell after you're born, because now that you're born, you're not an embryo, so we change the name. So that's the whole important thing. So we have embryonic cells in our body, all over our body. And as we lose the hundreds of billions of cells every day, the stem cells are the embryonic cells that replace them. So they can become lots of different things. Okay. Now back to the story. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, 30,000 genetically identical cells. I put them into three different Petri dishes. So all dishes have the same genetic cells. But what's different about this is I changed the composition of the growth medium. Sidebar two. <laughs> yep. What is growth medium? Well, I'll tell you what growth medium is. It's a laboratory version of blood. Cells live in the equivalent of blood. So when I grow human cells, I look at what human blood contains and then synthesize a version of the growth medium. So I make three different versions of culture medium. Slight, slight chemical difference. So let's call it, these are the environments that the cells grow in. So uh, uh, version A, B, and C, or environment A, B, and C, culture medium. So I have genetically identical cells in three dishes, but I feed each dish a different version of culture medium. Okay. And Okay, so uh, all the, while the cells are all genetically identical, their environments are different. Yep. So I say, uh, so what happens? I say, well, in one dish, the cells form muscle. In the second dish, the cells become bone. And in the third dish, there's fat cells. And, and you go, well, that's nice. I go, no, well, what was so profound is at the time I was doing this research, conventional science had genes control the character of, of the cells and of life. And I go, yeah, but all the cells had the same genes. So how did some become muscle and some become bone and all mm -hmm. that? Well, it was the genes. <laughs> the information was in the environment. Well, 
But all of a sudden, this was like, wait, wait, environment is controlling the genes, not the genes controlling the cells. What's the profound difference of everything? And the profound difference is this. What I was teaching at the moment in medical school was called genetic determinism, the belief that genes determine the character of your life, which if you to understand it means you become a victim of your heredity for this reason. As far as we know, we didn't pick the genes that we came with. We, if we don't like the genes, you can't change the genes. And then we tell you that genes turn on and off by themselves. And all of a sudden, you, you're not in the loop anymore. Your biology is not controlled by the genes you got the moment of conception. You've been programmed. And I say, well, what's the relevance? I say, well, you didn't pick them. You can't change them. You don't control them. You are a victim of your heredity. If there's cancer in your family, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, we anticipate, oh, my God, I have genes for these things. Yep. Okay, so that's the conventional belief, enslavement. It's called yep. genetics. <laughs> <laughs> but the new science, the new science that uh, I, I was working on, epigenetic control. Well, I said, what's the difference? Epi means above. Yep. So when you say epigenetic control, you're saying control above the genes. I go, what's that? Well, it's the environment, and more importantly, our perception of the environment is controlling the genetics because of a simple reason. Remember, culture medium was determining the fate of the cells. I say, yeah, but remember, culture medium is blood. <laughs> and yeah. a human body, a human body is like a skin covered petri dish. Yeah. with 50 trillion cells inside. And they're all living in the same culture medium blood. Point is this, does it make a difference if the cell's in a skin covered dish or in the plastic dish? And the answer is, nope, its fate is still controlled by whatever that growth medium is. So we are in a, a walking Petri dish with 50 trillion cells and the culture medium, our blood, is determining the genetics and the behavior, not the genes. And I go, so why is that important? Then we just take two steps more and I go, well, Somebody, somebody or something must be controlling the chemistry of the blood. So I say, yeah, the brain is controlling mm -hmm. the chemistry of the blood. I go, yeah. But then comes the best and last and most important question now, and that is simply this. So what chemistry should be put into the blood from the brain? And yeah. then I go, whatever the picture is in your mind, the brain translates that picture into complementary chemistry. So a happy picture releases happy chemistry and a scared picture releases fear chemistry. And I go, your thoughts are creating the blood chemistry and the blood chemistry is controlling the genetics. And then the bottom line is, oh my God, your thoughts are controlling your biology. It's like, yep, change your thoughts, change your biology. That is exactly where I was left with just this huge epiphany, right? Because I started thinking, I read what you said, our mind is the government of our 50 trillion cells, right? And that's right. what I, and I really believe this, you know, words of Buddha, what you think you become, there's been, there's been many humans before us that always preach this, that your, your thoughts literally control your biology. Uh, but when I, when I read this and I saw the research behind it, that's when I knew I was like, you know, at that point, this is what I want to stand for. This is the truth. And now, you know, six years removed from that, I've really noticed how research has caught up. There's so much research on epigenetics now. And it's it's so beautiful to have you on our podcast because you literally laid this groundwork for all of us. And, you know, I like to say I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, you know. So all of your work, like I'm so grateful for it because I can look back at it. I can learn from it. And then I can learn how I can add and be creative with it. I really do appreciate your work. Well, I, I see there's a difference here because I appreciate you for a very specific reason, Nav, and that is this. Well, I can talk over the heads of lots of people. You actually deal with the people. Mm -hmm. And that's where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. That's where it actually makes a difference. So to find physicians that are open to the new version of life uh, after being programmed <laughs> in yeah. medical school, uh, by unfortunately the pharmaceutical company's interests uh, we're, we're not really dealing with health we're dealing with an industry mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's unfortunate because its mission is not the health of the people its mission like any other corporate entity is how much money can we make irregardless of what the consequences are and so I'm really glad that there are young physicians out here that have an opportunity to say wait a minute before we pump all these drugs maybe we could talk to them and yeah, see what yeah, can happen. That's the, that's the goal of a family medicine physician right and so for us we connect with any from womb to tomb is what we say from the beginning of life all the way to the end of life and 
medicine, the state of medicine right now, it's frustrating. And I always say there's a lot of room for innovation right now. And this is the time and, and place to do so. You know, and I'm hopeful that conversations like this can can spark the minds of the future generations to believe that as well. Well, we have to because uh, the first thing is this is um, so by the last trimester of pregnancy, uh, let's just let's just talk about a laptop because everybody can see that. And I say, oh, I got a new laptop. I just bought it. Hey, it's got an operating system. Good. So I can turn it on. Now the screen lights up. And I say, so what? I say, well, do something. I say, I can't do anything. I, I Oh, I don't have programs. Uh-huh. I better put Word in there. So there are three levels. Operating system first. Then you have to put the programs in. And once you have the programs, then you can become creative. Mm-hmm. So now here's the basis. The brain is built with an operating system. Yep. But a child is of programs. And the programs cannot be genetic because programs are based on how we live, our lifestyle, our culture. Exactly. Well, cultures change, so you can't put it into genes. You have to program it at the time you're born. So you get a brand new computer brain. It's got an operating system. And I say, well, the significance is profound here. And I say, why? Because the first seven years is how you get programs through hypnosis. You observe your mother, your father, your siblings, and your community. And you just, all, you don't have to think. It's not thinking. It's subconscious. Sub, it's, it's just downloading what it sees. So a child watches the community and downloads the community behavior that's the program. But by age seven, the brain ramps up to a higher vibration. Now consciousness kicks in. And that means now me as an entity can use the keyboard. And yep. I, uh, and that's when consciousness can take over. So the bottom line is this. A, everybody's been programmed because there's no way you could be working on this planet as a human unless you have programs to work with everybody else in harmony with them. Uh, but then recognize this. The programs didn't come from you. They came from the other people around you. So if they have a problem in their lives, you automatically downloaded the same damn problem. And so, for example, very pronounced is that uh, they look at the fate of what happens to children that get adopted into a family, let's say, where there's cancer. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out, well, the adopted child gets the same family cancer like any of the natural siblings. The one conclusion just from that fact, the gene itself does not cause cancer. Yep. And we have to understand that because, uh, Nav, you're going to have to deal with these people on the street. And they've been programmed to believe that, oh, my God, cancer genes, bad genes, cardiovascular genes, Alzheimer genes. And, and, and they keep looking for, oh, my God, I'm a victim because I got these genes and they control me. Uh, and now we're talking the new science that you're working with, Nav, epigenetics. It says, no, your consciousness not just selects your genes. Your consciousness can rewrite your genes. So you can, with one gene, a a gene is a blueprint to make a protein, which is the building blocks of this body. With one gene blueprint, you can make over 3,000 different proteins just by the way you are experiencing life. And all of a sudden it says, oh my God, we're masters, except we've never been told. Uh, And and I say, well, then here's the, let let me get to this conclusion now, then we open it up and you can grill me deep. (laughs) The, the, The point about it is this. So I say, wait. So my conscious mind is creative. Yeah, the conscious mind has wishes and desires. Just ask anybody what they want out of their life. And I say, why? Because whatever answer they give you is creative. I want to be healthy. I'm happy. Right, that's creative. That's conscious. Mm-hmm. And I say, and the subconscious got programs in it. And I go, well, yeah, but once you're conscious, you, you can play the programs, do what you want. Then I go, and here's the, the, the whole problem, the whole problem, Nav. Everybody out there, here's the problem. Because a conscious mind is not just creative, it can think. Then there's a problem because thinking is an inside job. Yep. So I say, hey, Nav, tell me what you're doing on Saturday. At this very moment, if it's not written in front of you, you can tell me. I say, where are you going to get the answer from? You say, oh, I can think about the answer. I go, oh. then here's the whole problem. Thinking is inside, so I redirect my attention. I'm not looking outside. I'm now looking inside to get an answer. Saturday, Saturday, where you don't even have to have eyes. Saturday, Saturday, what am I doing? Okay. Uh, and I say, why is it relevant? And I say, well, what if you're driving the car and all of a sudden you start thinking and your attention stops looking at the road and goes inside and say, oh my God, now you kill yourself. Yeah. Uh, here's the cool part. When the conscious mind is thinking and takes its attention away from looking out, but looks in to answers then the subconscious is autopilot. 
except for the subconscious programs didn't come from you. They came from other people. And your wishes and desires are not involved in that programming because yeah. that was their wishes and desires or their problems, such as a problem that could cause cancer. The first seven years is where the basic programs come in. Then, and here it is, here it is, big box. 95% of our life is spent thinking, which translates 95% of your life is controlled by the program and not your wishes. So we're all living in the matrix. We've all been programmed. And the idea is that your fate is now not determined by you, but by whoever you downloaded your program from. Uh, and then you're going to pick up their behavior, which if it's good, you're going to stay healthy. But if they have a bad behavior, you're going to create a problem which will medically be relevant. And NAV will have to see you <laughs> if you don't get that problem straightened out. Because our life is not created from our wishes and desires, only 5%. 95% of our life is just a playback from the programs. Exactly. And most of those programs are negative. And these programs control our genetics, behavior, our life experiences. And then all of a sudden, Matrix is right. You've all been programmed. And if you take the red pill, the red pill, you can get out of that program. And in the movie, that's what they take, a red pill. And all of a sudden, they're not in the program anymore. And then they become creative masters of everything because they're not being programmed. And then we find out that when people fall in love, the experience of love is the equivalent of the red pill. Because when you fall in love like that, you stop thinking, you stay present. It's called staying mindful. Mm -hmm. You keep your mind present. Why? Well, this person came into your life after you've been looking for them your whole life. They show up. This is, this is not time to think. It's time to be there. The most interesting aspect about falling in love is your life changes in 24 hours. Your life could be blah, 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 your whole life. And then you meet this person. And then you have this whole wonderful experience of love. And just 24 hours, you went from blah, 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 your whole life to heaven on earth. And the answer is the first time you stop thinking allows you then not just 5% of your life, but you can run your life over 90% of your life with your wishes and desires. Before, it was just five. Now, all of a sudden, you have the opportunity. I am the master. I am creating. I go, yeah, look what you created. Heaven on earth. But it was always there. <laughs> it was always there, except for the fact that your program didn't let you see it. Your conscious mind takes power over subconscious when you fall in love, okay? Yeah. And, and, and conscious is creative, so all of a sudden, you, you're, you're now creating your life. When you are thinking, you're on automatic pilot, and it's being created for you unconsciously by the programs you received as an infant. Yep. Uh, and, and you don't see these. So I, I, I've told the same story. Nav, you must have heard it a thousand times from oh, me yeah. now. But the story is uh, you have a friend. You know your friend's very, behavior very, very well. And you know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the exact same behavior as their parents. So, you you know, you got to tell them. And you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And I say, back away from Bill. Because <laughs> you say he's like his dad. Bill's going to go, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. Everyone laughs. I say, that's the most profound story of all stories for this reason. Everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad, but because his attention is thinking, he's not observing his own behavior, but he has an idea of who he is in his conscious mind, but the behavior that's coming out is his parents' behavior, and he can't see it because his attention is not looking out. So he's the only one that can't see his own behavior because everyone else does, and here's the point. We are all Bill. There's not one of us out here in this yeah. world right now that is not Bill. <laughs> because all of us uh, have been programmed, and for the conventional person, 95% of the day, they play this program unconsciously because their conscious mind is busy thinking. And then all of a sudden, your life is not what you wish it to be. It becomes what you've been programmed to be. I couldn't agree more. And this is, so there's so much there. Like the first thing that we take from this is, your mind can govern all 50 trillion cells in the body. But in order to really understand how we can govern the mind, we have to look at nature versus nurture, right? And this is where I wanted to talk about the adverse childhood experiences study. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. The, the, from the third trimester of pregnancy all the way up to about six or seven, that's when our brain is being programmed. And that's actually when the brain 
it develops from the bottom up. It actually begins developing, obviously, in the first trimester, but really by the third trimester, because all the structures have developed, then the environment really influences how that brain structure will go on to become developed. And this is where the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, it just it related so well to programming. And I just want to throw some statistics out there. We've talked about this in past podcasts, so our audience out there knows a little bit about it. The Adverse Childhood Experience Study is a large-scale study that showed early childhood trauma was, was linked to chronic disease later on in life. And examples, 10 examples of early childhood trauma in those first early years of life included one, physical abuse, two, sexual abuse, three, emotional abuse, four, physical neglect, five, emotional neglect, six, exposure to domestic violence, seven, household substance abuse, eight, mental illness in the household, nine, parental separation or divorce, and 10, incarceration household member. Results found that anybody who had more than four adverse childhood experiences had a seven-fold increase in alcoholism, doubling their risk of diagnosis of cancer, and had a fourfold increase in emphysema. For individuals who had more than six, they actually had a 3,000% increase in attempted suicide, and on average died 20 years earlier. So we're basically like practically looking at what you're talking about, how we're programmed, what we grow up around is the environment, usually your mother, your father, your foster parents, and you know their behaviors, their mind, their body, their spirit, their entire being, really helps you develop into the human being you are. And those are the programs you're going to go on to take on. And they've already scientifically proven that if you're exposed to adverse childhood experience, it can lead to deficits in those programs, which leads to chronic disease and cancer and all this stuff. So this is a beautiful way to really sum up everything you're saying in a way that shows that long-term outcomes and exposures are really related to that. And this is where you know, I want to bring the control back into our being and I want to bring it back to our space. So there is ways to reprogram our mind and to become aware of the program. And in order to do that, we really have to understand the, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, right? And that's where I, I would love for you to explain what is conscious mind, what is subconscious mind, and how can we start reprogramming our So let's start with the more primitive mind, that's subconscious. And that means these are behaviors that are built into the system to operate without you thinking about them, okay? Uh, some of them are, are reflexes or instincts, like if a ball comes toward your face, you'll automatically blink without you even thinking about it because yeah. it's built in, protection, okay? So uh, it's got some of those. Then it learns programs that we repeat over and over again. So when you learned how to walk before age two, there was a practice period. Every day you tried to stand up. Every day you had to try and handle it. So the more practice you did, you finally got it. Uh, but as you were practicing, repetition is the foundation of how to put program in a subconscious. So the more you repeat it, the more you practice it. If you want to make a change, you, you read the self-help book. You do all the video stuff. You watch this podcast. You say, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, but where did you get it? And the answer yeah. was conscious mind because the creative mind learns from any number of ways reading a book watching a video going to a lecture whatever just go aha and conscious mind can change subconscious mind's called habit mind yeah and that's where habits are and i go well what's relevant i said well if a habit changes then it's not a habit anymore a habit resists change so once you put something in the subconscious by definition it will resist change and thank God, I mean, think about it. You learned how to walk before you're four. You're still walking. You could be 80, 90 years old. It's the same program you got when you were two. Yep. Uh, subconscious has got good things in it. But if you get a bad program, then unfortunately, that, that negative program take you off your track mm -hmm. and, and could take health right out of your system. As you mentioned, the health of a child during the year. Um, people don't understand this because if we keep teaching people that their genes control their life, then we're yeah. actually, again, going back. Well, you're a victim. And exactly. you can't do anything about it because it's genes. But we, pharmaceutical company, we will make medication for pills. you. And yeah. it's like, well, th this whole thing is totally screwed because that's a belief system. Exactly. Uh, and, and the idea about belief system is best exemplified by placebo. <laughs> yeah. Here's a pill that's going to heal you and, and nothing else has worked. 
And here's the most magical new one. I love it because one ad used to say, and it's purple. Like, that's going to be a big deal. It's a purple pill. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, and I take this purple pill because it's going to heal me. I get better. And then find out later it was a sugar pill. And then I say, so clearly, what healed you? Not the sugar pill. Your belief in the sugar pill. Like, oh, that's exactly what the whole story is in a nutshell. And a minimum of one third and presumably up to two thirds of all medical intervention healing didn't come from the intervention, but came from the placebo consequences of it. And again, it says, look, you are very powerful, but what your program says is you're a victim. And now I control you because once you're a victim, you're going to pay any damn amount for a rescuer. And yep. then all of a sudden you find that 60% of bankruptcies in the United States are because people got sick, got medical bills that were so extraordinarily high. Guess what? 95% of your life is coming from the program. So there's a very important key moment here, and it says this. Look at your life. Mm -hmm. The things that you like that come into your life, they come in because you have a program to acknowledge that. But this one. Anything you want, but you have to work hard, struggle, sweat over, put a lot of effort. I'm working. I'm going to make it happen. I'm putting a lot of effort in this. I say, why are you working so hard? And the answer is, inevitably, that destination is not covered in your program. Yeah. And so you're trying to override the program that is operating 95% of the day with a brain processor that's a million times more powerful than the conscious mind that's operating 5% of the day. There's a struggle built in here now. Oh, you yeah. can see the struggle. And so the idea is this. I look at my life and I say, I'm looking for a relationship. I suck at it. I say, well, then you got some bad programs in there and that's not going to work. So I say, you want to change the program. And now comes the question that you asked. And as I said, nobody's in the subconscious mind. So you can talk to your blue in the face. There's nobody in there that will listen to your suggestion. And the programs that are in there don't want to change. That's already yeah. a given. So I say, OK, what do I have to do? I say, well, how'd you get the program? I say, well, the first seven years you were in hypnosis. The brain was in theta, a vibration uh, characterized as imagination which kids express all the time, yep. but it's also hypnosis. So I said, well, you need to go see a hypnotherapist. I said, no, you don't need to see a hypnotherapist for a simple reason. Your brain has different vibrational frequencies. The lowest one, delta, is sleep. The next one, theta, is, uh, uh, is imagination. But the next higher vibration, alpha, is conscious. And then beta, higher consciousness, and gamma, even higher consciousness. I say, so what? At work, we're at beta, working on a high vibration. Then we come home and we relax, so we calm down. The next, the lower level, alpha, is a calm consciousness. And then there's that point where you just fall off the sleep, man. Consciousness, just like the light switch, boom, off sleep at that moment. I go, at that moment you just fell asleep, alpha dropped, and now you're in theta. So there's a period of time right after you disconnect, I'm sleeping, that the brain is operating in theta. I say, so why? That's hypnosis. So I say, what? Put earphones on your head as you're going to bed with a program that is playing the belief that you want to manifest in your life, whether it's relationships, job, health. I don't care what the self-help program is, but you play it on the earphones. I say, what? Well, at first you might hear it while you're still awake, but there's a moment where you actually fall asleep. Now, the only thing that hears it is theta, that's subconscious. So you're not sending information to the conscious mind. It is now being directed to the subconscious, self-hypnosis. So you can uh, look at your life. Anything that you struggle with, you want to change, find a, a self-help program that will feed you all the positive words to make a new program. You repeat this. Re repetition is real important. Oh, yeah. And while you're sleeping... You could download a whole new program. And then here's the cool part, just so people know, well, I have to make an effort. I go, well, you make a little effort to change, but guess what? The moment you've changed it, there's no more effort because yeah. you will now automatically run 95% of the day that program that will give you what you're looking for. And I go, wow. So a little bit of work to change the program. But once the program is changed, it's automatic 95% of the day, no more work. So it's really cool. The growth mindset and neuroplasticity. We, we talk about it every time. And like everything you're saying, 
you have to have that growth mindset and belief that you can change and that it requires work. And neuroplasticity proves that the more effort you put in, the more repetition you gain, the easier it becomes. So yeah, continue. That's that's really cool and very interesting. Use it or lose it applies to everything in the body, not just the muscles. People think if I exercise, I build them up. And No, brain cells. And the biggest problem facing us as a country right now today is this, is that there's a part of the brain that's involved with creativity. And it has to be exercised just like a, you know, if you want to be a marathon runner, you got to exercise it. Yep. But we stop giving programs in school on creativity because they call them, well, it's not science and math and engineering. It's art. It's music. It's shop or whatever that equivalent is or home ec where you do things and you create something. Creativity. And I say, why is it relevant? Because you just brought it up. Use it or lose it. If yeah. I don't exercise my creativity, uh, the neurons that were supposed to be built for that fall yeah. apart. And I say, why did I lose the neurons? And then the answer is this. The biology is the most efficient form of uh, engineering on the planet. Biology is as efficient Beautiful. as anything can be. I say, why is it relevant? Because biology doesn't waste energy. If yeah. something's not being used, then biology says, I'm not maintaining this as a, a trophy. Here, look. I used to be smart, but I'm not using it. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> if you're not using it, it goes away. And I say, because when you take that into consideration, you recognize the programming that we're giving our children is not fully programming that will develop their creative nature, their character, their intelligence and all that. We are down dumbing them. We're putting programs in that uh, you follow this program. Now it's a habit. I say, why is it relevant? You can't think outside of the habit. You become the habit. And creativity is one of the biggest losses in our nervous system because there's a period of development and it's like exercise it, it becomes great, don't use it, it's going to disappear. And so this is really important part of the programming is to, yeah. to, to put this all in. So I say, okay, great, first seven years, all a child is doing is downloading just like a video recorder, just downloading everything that observes, behavior and everything. But after age seven, consciousness kicks in so now there's another way to add programs uh and that is now you're in a, a alpha or beta i say well yeah but how do i i learned new programs since i was seven i mean i learned how to drive a car <laughs> you know fortunately yeah. uh and i say well what is relevant i said well learning after age seven uh, uh, uh requires a different way of putting that information in after age seven repetition is the primary process of putting it in habituation it is called Repeat something over and over and over again. Not repeat something. Here's what you repeat. Any program, whether you're putting it in uh, in the self-hypnosis mode or whether you're putting it in the repetition mode, habituation mode, the most important key of every program that goes in is that, A, it's in present tense, meaning yes. it's already here. Okay. Yes. Uh, and I say, why is that important? Uh, let's just say today, Nav, uh, we just record, I want to be healthy. Your program says, I want to be healthy. Your program never said, I am I healthy. I am healthy, yeah. And that, because it's feedback, and want means we're going to it. M is I have it. So it sounds very strange. You could be uh, called terminal cancer, and I want you to sit there and go, I am perfectly healthy. I, you know, whatever. I want you to, you know, all those positive things. It's like, yeah, but I'm, I'm dying again. I say, no, you have to vision a future as if it already exists because the subconscious mind does not have time to it. A subconscious mind does not know, you know, what you did 40 years ago from what you did yesterday because there's no time. So the, the relevance about this is then you have to put every program first. It has to be present tense as if you already have what you want. And two, it always has to be accompanied by very positive words like this is great. This is what I want. This is it. This is beautiful. I love this, whatever, you know, so I am healthy and, you know, happy and loving. Yeah. Uh, and the point I said, why about it? I said, because the first seven years was hypnosis, which you can do again with the earphones at night. But after age seven, all new programs come in only on the basis of repetition, repeating them over and over and over again. You want to play an instrument? You damn well have to practice over and over and over. Then you learn. There's new age phraseology. I have to say it because it's kind of funny, but it's yeah. like fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah, Meaning yeah. if you're not a happy person and you're wandering around your whole world every day going, geez, I'm not, this sucks. I'm the, blah, blah, blah. I say, then what do you want to do? I say, you walk around now and you say to yourself, I am happy. 
I am happy. And I say, you know, but clearly it doesn't look like you're happy. And I go, that doesn't, that's not the point. I am exactly. repeating the words, I am happy. I am happy. I say, why is it relevant? Because habituation yeah. will automatically put that in there after a period of time. And then one day you'll wake up and guess what? You'll be happy. And now you didn't even have to say anything. Why? Because now 95% of the day, that new program is operating and you'll be happy. So we are creators. That's the whole idea. And uh, there's one last way, and to me the most important way of change, is called oh, yeah. energy, energy psychology. Energy psychology is like super learning. You say, what's super learning? You say, maybe you've seen somebody open a book and read a page, read a page by just moving their finger down the page. As fast as they move that finger down the page, they read every word on that page. That's an example of super learning. So mm -hmm. I say, what's the point? I say, well, a guy can stand in a bookstore and turn the page as fast as they turn the page. They can read a book. They can stand there 10 minutes and read a whole book for, for nothing. Okay. So I say, oh, okay. But if you use super learning technology, you uh -huh. can download new behaviors in minutes versus days or weeks. This is a time where we need to change in energy psychology, a whole variety of modalities that sort of push the, the, the uh, super learning button. I say, why is it relevant? Because once you identify what program you want to be true, again, positive, present tense kind of stuff, yep. you can use one of these modalities and rewrite that program 15, 20 minutes. Okay? So I said there's a number of them on my website. Very simple, brucelipton.com. Mm -hmm. Under resources, there's belief change and belief modification resources, belief change. There's about 20 plus different kinds of modalities that you can engage in to make rapid downloads. Yep. Uh, and we need this. We need this because we're in a time crunch right now. Uh, and so, again, look at your life. If you're not living heaven on earth, then that means there's something that you're trying to overcome and whatever that thing is you're overcoming is invisible, unconscious, operating 95% of the day from our own minds. And, and the reason why this is important is because if you believe you're a victim and you say, my problems in life are because of that person and that person and that thing and all that, you are saying you are powerless. I am yeah. powerless. These people control my life. I go, well, that's an illusion. You bought into it. Yeah. You're the powerful one. And so therefore... We have to recognize we are the powerful element. We are not victims. We're creating. You have to own your own creation. Otherwise, you're claiming victim. Oh, everything I did was for me. Okay, but that thing that happened, that was they did that. And I said, well, that's the moment you just gave away the power. And the fact is nobody has power over you except for your own mind. <laughs> and if your mind buys into you are a victim, then you're the victim. Henry Ford, founder of motor company Ford. Uh, said it very simply and profoundly. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, it's, you're right. Exactly. And it basically says from the foundation, from the Buddha, what you think you become to Henry Ford, to everybody today, we need to change the consciousness because we don't own where the creating force and so the uniformity of the understanding, consciousness as a creator says, stop being a victim and start becoming the creator you actually are. And the first thing is unload those programs that have disempowered you uh, yes. since uh, you were a kid. This is so important and it's so groundbreaking. I think a lot of us are programmed to have negative thoughts about ourselves, kind of a negative outlook on life. And when you could take a step back and realize those are other people's programs that I'm functioning off of. I think this is where we could get into the reprogramming space. Now, you mentioned three specific reprogramming techniques. You mentioned self-hypnosis, repetition, and energy psychology. And yes. there's just a few things that you said that, from personal experience, I truly believe them to be completely true. First off, the type of dialogue that you're using, present tense, and being positive all the time. So the law of attraction always talks about whatever it is that you wish to manifest in your life, you never speak of it as if you're trying to get it or I, I want to be healthy. I wish I was healthy. You speak of it as if you've already received it, right? And that's and it's very hard. Psychologically, you could be, I've got terminal cancer. Oh, yeah, then say I am healthy. That, that's it. like, 
What? <laughs> but, but you have to. Is, and they, they've proven uh, 50 percent of individuals who have cancer who had a positive mindset. They're, they're like two or three hundred times more likely to actually overcome the cancer than someone who just believed that this was the end of it. Right. And there's so many different placebos you could talk about, whether it's your perception of stress. I'm big on believing that I've already received it. So when I'm saying I am healthy, they also scientifically prove that the brain doesn't know the difference between what you're imagining and what's actually happening. So they did studies on marathon runners where they would imagine running a marathon and they looked at their brain waves and them running a marathon and they looked at their brain waves and they're very similar. And this is where visualization and kind of that manipulation of your imagination, it can have such a big difference on reframing. I'm big on what you're saying because it's worked for me personally. And, you know, then we get into the repetition. So all of this stuff, unless it's done daily, and it's done with an intention. You know, you can make or break a habit in 21 days. It's been proven that neuroplasticity, your brain will rewire itself in like 21 days of consistency. So, um, but that's where we get into energy psychology. You mentioned a few different ones. I know there's holographic repatterning. There's body talk, EMDR, EFT. Your personal favorite is psych. Psych. Yeah. Psych and I have some experience in EMDR. The so research has proven EMDR to be extremely beneficial for patients who have PTSD. And when we look at the brain scans of those who have PTSD, say you had something terrible happen in your childhood. Well, say it's 45 years removed from when that happened. Anytime you have a flashback or something reminds you of that, your brain actually goes back to the time it happened. And what happens to the brain is the left side of the brain actually shuts off completely. So this was Bessel van der Kolk, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. We had him on our podcast. He was one of the first people to do MRI scans on people who had PTSD. And he was one of the first people to discover that the left side of the brain, which is responsible for mathematics, thought process, and kind of step-by-step -step processing, goes out of the window. So this is why when you have someone who has PTSD, they, they have a flashback. They completely lose all control. They go into fight or flight, and they're unable to really process what's happening. And that's because the left side of the brain shuts off. So what EMDR, what it allows people to do is access the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain at the same time. And now imagine you have PTSD, you're having flashbacks, and the left side of your brain's turning off. If you're using this, these techniques to be able to access both sides of the brain hand in hand, it actually helps you reprocess and reframe much faster. So when you're saying you can reprocess, reframe in 15 or 20 minutes, it's actually scientifically possible. You know, and that's where I'm not very familiar with psych kinesiology. So could you teach me more about it and how it works? Well, uh, the, the whole psych K thing comes down to exactly what you said about right and left hemispheres. When we are infants below age seven, both hemispheres are integrated. It's called whole yeah. brain or hemisync. And this is how come children can download massive quantities of data. But after age seven, the hemispheres separate. And then it's like a wave. Sometimes during the day, you're more left. And then sometimes you're more right, more intellectual, more emotional. And so it depends on where you are during the day. It happens several times. But the idea is you want to get back into super learning. Then you want the two hemispheres to come. Remember, my right arm is controlled by my left hemisphere. But if yep. the right arm crosses the midline, it gets picked up by the other hemisphere again. So oh. so all of a sudden, it's controlled by my left hemisphere when it's over here. But if it crosses the midline, now it's controlled still by my left hemisphere because that's where the muscles are controlled, but it's working in harmony with the right hemisphere, which is observing this part of the field. Very so good. when you cross your arms and, and you hold them like this, okay? And here's another part, because the arms and legs are both the same thing in this regard. Yeah. And this is... If you understand it, this is why when you see people relax unconsciously, if they're sitting in a chair and relaxing, there's a tendency to cross their ankles. To wow. Sit, uh, wow. Just watch them. It's, just, it's a natural thing. I say, why? Because when you cross your ankles, you're doing the same thing. Right and left become integrated. When you become integrated, it calms people down. So let's say a person is on a plane and they're freaking out. It's like, okay, go, you know, do your cross your arms, cross your feet and sit there in about two minutes the brain will start to calm down because now it's hemisync, but it's also super learning. So if I'm in a super learning state and I have programmed a belief I want to be real and I'm sitting in this state and there's a process to do it, uh, which is uh, there's some steps in here. OK, yeah, but broadly, I'm in a state where now uh, I'm in a super learning state. OK, 
across my arms and legs. My hemispheres are now integrated. And all I have to really say to myself is, uh, let's say uh, the biggest problem that most people have, and you mentioned it slightly, and that is uh, people uh, don't see themselves as lovable. They don't see themselves as lovable because, as you mentioned, when parents are raising children, they act like coaches on a sports team. Yeah, now, right. when a player on a team isn't doing well, the coach doesn't go, oh, please, just do better. No, the coach is like, come on, that's not good enough. Who do you think you are? You don't deserve to be on this team. You know, and I go, you know, but those are the words that parents are trying to tell kids who are under seven to, like, you know, needle them to do better. And I go, well, here's the damn problem. A child under seven is not conscious Meaning the the meaning that you had by telling me I'm not good enough as a coach was that if I understand what you're saying, then I will say to myself, OK, I will do better to stay on the team. So that's the psychology. But I yes. said, but a child doesn't have the details. It just said, what did the child hear? Not good enough, not smart enough, not this enough. I go, well, when parents say that and the child's in a record mode, which is the first seven years, then the program they download is not good enough, not deserving, not lovable. Actually, the number is over 85% of people will not test positive, I love myself. I say, why not? Because of the criticism, Yeah. I'm not good enough. So what's the program? I'm not good enough. And I say, then what? Now here comes the problem. 95% of the day, you are operating from what? The program, not good enough. I say, yeah. uh, here's uh, uh, the function of the mind. Just, let's put this in a box with labels. Big important function of the mind is to create coherence between your belief and your reality. Amen. If my belief is not good enough, then the job of the mind is to create behavior to demonstrate I'm not good enough. Uh, uh, and I did because that's my program. So if I have a program, I don't deserve things because that's what my parents said. And then someone says, let me give you this. And then it's like, I can't accept it. Why? I don't deserve things. That's what the mind's going to do. Push it away. Get rid of it. I'm not lovable. Why is that important? Because that accounts for the damn mess that people are having in regard to relationships on this planet. And the significance is this. If most of us are programmed not being lovable and someone else comes up and they say, I love you, what's your mind? Go back into the machine now. What's your mind? It's hearing, I love you, but the mind is saying, but I'm not lovable. And then what's that going to mean? Well, then you're going to look at that person who just said that as, well, you have no quality control because I know I'm not lovable, yeah. and, but know yeah. that. <laughs> so you, what will you do is your function of the mind is to create coherence. If I'm not lovable, then the function of the mind is to traumatize or short circuit any kind of I am lovable that could come yes. into my life, like from somebody else. And I will push them away. And the day they leave, then my mind will go, yep. Uh, 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 and this is the biggest problem of, of almost all of us is uh, if you're not lovable, you cannot be loved by somebody else. And then I say, well, why is the problem? I say 50 percent plus of all relationships end up in separation, divorce. Why? Because we were never able to put in the program. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where the issue comes from. So I say, so what do you do? I say you get into this whole brain posture is called. OK. You wait a couple of minutes, uh, and, and there's more to it because it's like whether I put my right arm over my left or my left over my right, that makes a difference because they represent hemispheres, and the legs represent hemispheres, so left over right, right, there's a way of testing all that, okay? But what's the point? You get into that whole brain moment, and you say to yourself, I am lovable, and I go, here's the science of muscle testing. The subconscious is 90% of the brain. It's a million times more powerful than the conscious, which is right behind the forehead here, and I go, well, because of its power, its job is to control muscle movements. Because if you try to consciously control walking, which we tried to do, you know, we tried to put that in our heads when we were walking as infants, okay? You cannot, with your conscious mind, a small processor, drive all of the muscles and the, and the nerve spindles that keep us balanced in this. Uh, you can't drive that with conscious mind. It's not a big enough processor. So subconscious controls muscles, all muscles not just arm muscles, eye muscles, okay? Mm -hmm. I say, okay, so I say, so what? When you make a statement with a conscious mind, that's creative. You can say any damn thing you want. I have three heads. You can say that. <laughs> but the subconscious mind only takes a, it compares what was just said to the program 
yes. that we have. If the conscious mind agrees and the subconscious agrees with what the conscious mind just said, creative. Let's say I say I have three heads. Subconscious mind's going, yeah, right. That's not obviously that's not true. So there's disharmony. Yeah. Disharmony. What? Yeah. Conscious mind says one thing. Subconscious mind says the other. Disharmony causes the weakening of the muscles because the subconscious, which is controlling muscles, loses harmony. And that's what causes the muscle to drop. OK, but if you make a statement in your conscious creative mind and your subconscious mind has verification that that's the way it is, then both minds are in harmony. The muscle is rock solid. You can't budge it. OK, yes. so the idea of muscle testing is really just testing whether you find harmony or disharmony between a conscious creative statement and a program that exists in the system. Mm -hmm. So you want to know if you're lovable, you, you can use your arm. You can put your arm out and have somebody, you know, there's a process like we don't have time to go fully in it, but there's a way to make it more accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say, uh, how do you know if you're lovable or not? Because the answer is this. You put your arm out and you say, I am lovable. Yeah. If your arm drops with pressure on it, that means, well, nope, <laughs> there's disharmony. And right away it says your subconscious doesn't agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. Now I know I'm in trouble because like, oh, my God. I, I, I'm not lovable. That's what my program, I want to change it. So I say, okay, help. A, self-help tape, earphones at night, play I am lovable programs. Okay, B, say all day, I love myself. I love myself. Even if you, you don't believe it, I don't care. It's repetition. Yeah. And I keep saying that. There's a point where you will love yourself. And then all of a sudden, guess what? It will change your relationship with everyone on the outside. Because once you love yourself, you're open to be loving and all that stuff, okay? You can use an eye chart or a muscle because your eye muscles will focus on, I can read that line of letters. I go, great, now I say, make a statement. And if the mind doesn't agree with, the subconscious doesn't agree with that statement, the eye muscles get weaker. And guess what? You will not be able to read that same line. You're gonna have to go up and read a couple lines higher where the letters are bigger because mm -hmm. the muscles have just got a little shaky with uh, not being in harmony. So you can test any muscle on by you could go like a finger and go like that, you know, like yeah, yeah, finger. Yeah. or you could go like this with lock your two fingers together in a ring and try and pull them apart. If you make a statement that is in harmony, you will not be able to pull these fingers apart wow. from here. OK, uh -huh. uh, but if you make a statement that's in disharmony and you pull it'll, the, uh, one of the fingers will give way. That's a self muscle test. That's beautiful. Something else that you said that is also scientifically proven the, the fake it till you make it. Like even if so me myself, like, you know, having gone through some significant childhood trauma, one of my programs was you're not lovable. You're, you're not going to be good enough no matter what you do. And I, I saw how that manifested in my relationship. I always self-sabotaged anything. So if someone ever said I love you, it would, it would be in disharmony with what I believed about myself. So I'd find a way to sabotage that to prove to myself I was right. And it wasn't yeah. until I started actually working on my own positivity, but then also recognizing this wasn't your fault. The result of my program was other people. Usually people who grew up with severe childhood trauma, they're the result of other people doing things that they were dealing with and they're putting that onto you. It has nothing to really do with you as much as it has to do with their own self-mastery, right? And once you can learn to detach from that, you can realize it's not your fault. Then you can start saying, I am lovable. And it's hard. I understand for anybody out there who's like, yeah, but when I don't feel lovable, me just saying I'm lovable, it doesn't do anything for me. There's been tests where smiling, for example. So smiling has been proven to release endorphins of the brain, right? But they also saw people who weren't happy. If they put a pen in between their teeth and they literally simulated what a smile looks like, it would still release the endorphins. So that, that's what's so interesting about this manipulation, right? Is yes. that even if you do it and you don't believe in it, but you do it consistently with repetition, my friends, the change is possible. And it's very important for anybody out there to understand that and, and just to believe it for themselves. Yeah. I, I think a point that's very important that you made because it comes up a lot in my programs, and that is this. There are very important words that are that's that cause a problem. Guilt, shame, victim, blame. All of these words are, are, are based on like, how, how can you be guilty if you don't know how to do something and someone says, do it, and you say, I don't know how to do it, and they make you do it and you don't do it right, and they look at you, well, you're guilty, and it's like, no, I didn't know how to do it. 
Okay. If you would have taught me how to do it, then I would have been able to do it. Yeah. So yeah. the idea is this. But if you taught me a negative thing and I start expressing that negative thing, am I guilty? Well, well, you're the one, but are you guilty? Not really, because that program that you got wasn't good. Yeah. So, so the whole idea of this story is this. History is programming. If we own that the programming was the problem, that's great because it says it's not me, it's the yes. program. Because at this moment going forward from here, I say now I'm in control. Now yeah. I'm going to now I'm going to be in charge. Yeah. It's your exercise that mm -hmm. you have to fix it. Fixing them isn't going to change anything. It's fixing you, okay? Yeah. So we have to start to recognize that these words uh, blame, shame, guilt, victim, and all that. They only apply to this. If you know there's a right way to do something and then knowingly decide yeah. not to do it, then yeah. you're guilty. Yeah. But if you didn't know there was a right way and you weren't able to do it, I can't blame you as being guilty because no one gave you a right way. That was the programming part that failed. And this mm -hmm. is where the programming comes from. So we really have to let people know what happened in the past let go of this. Yes. But reprogram it to go in the future. But recognize you created it unknowingly mm -hmm. because of whatever your teacher was gave you the wrong information. But I can't blame you for that because it was really the download where the problem came from. It wasn't you. It was the download. So we have to let go previous to this. Let it go. It's interesting. I'm, I wasn't raised in a religious anything, really. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember, you know, hearing many times the words that Jesus apparently said at the last moment on the cross was, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I'm going to say, all those people that screwed your life up, forgive them. Wow. But you have to forgive them. Why? They didn't even know what the hell they were doing. They were operating 95% from their program anyway. There are ways to change it. You are now going to take responsibility. And when you put in the programs you want, the beautiful part is I said, after that, it's not even any more work because now it's automatic after that. And that's why my book, The Honeymoon Effect, came out because I was one of those people who had crap relationship programs from my parents. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't get relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. But... Then I met my partner, Margaret, when I was 50. So there's some hope for old wow. people out there. You oh, can age, sometimes 50 is a good age to meet somebody. Beautiful. And uh, and the idea was, but we both knew about programming and stuff like that. And so when a bad program came up, Bill, me being Bill, playing a program I can't see, but she could see it. Yes. Rather than getting into an argument, which most couples get into, because the one says, you said that. And the one is going. What are you talking about? Because they don't even have any memory of saying it was automatic anyway. That, that's when the whole honeymoon falls apart. But if yeah. both people in the relationship know, look, part of this behavior, 95% is coming from the subconscious. If that behavior isn't any good, it's not a time to make a fight over. It's time to make a change. <laughs> and yes. if every time a, a program that comes up that you weren't that was sabotaging yourself and somebody else, your friend, your partner, I'm sees you. It helps that you, they say, but you didn't see what you were doing. You didn't see what you were saying. Did you really mean this? Is that what you want? And the idea, now we're not arguing. Now we're discussing whether we should change the program. And yeah. then if you change the program and you get rid of those negative programs, then guess what? You have heaven on earth every day of your life. Every day of your life, as long as you live. Why? Because it was the negative programs that sabotage you. And if they're gone... Heaven on Earth honeymoon is not a short period. It's an entire existence. Exactly. What's so important about that? A lot of the times when we're downloading from childhood, and if your parents forgive them, but if they made any mistakes or your caregivers made mistakes, sometimes we download all of that as hurt and pain. And we'll carry around that hurt for decades on decades. And we'll literally not know it, but we'll be reacting from it. And one of the things you mentioned there is the relationship with someone that you love. For me, one of the thing, one of the greatest things my wife did at one point was we revealed to each other our programs. We revealed to one another, hey, we were raised this way and I, I have this thought process of myself and it kind of sabotaged our relationship. But once I could get past the ego and once I could get past the uh, victim and once I could get past kind of blaming her for it and I start taking accountability and responsibility for my own programs, knowing damn well I can change them. Knowing damn well that I could change them, 
this is when it be, every time she reveals to me one of my programs that I feel like I'm hurting onto hurt, shame, guilt, pain from the past, I can use that as an opportunity to learn, grow, and reprogram. And after a while, every time something's revealed to you about your programs that aren't working like you want to, you can start seeing them as opportunities to change. And this means change epigenetically, mentally, physically, spiritually. It's a transformation where you start valuing growth more than anything. And over time, it, it's like a constant feedback. With every Everything that reveals to you a program that might be at fault, it, it becomes something positive over time. I, I really love what you say there. And I wanted to think about how does this relate to money? Money and energy. I saw a video that you made on money and energy, and I, I can't leave this segment without you explaining so eloquently just uh, the equivalence of money and energy and how it affects health. Okay. Well, first recognize this. Energy is life. we already given that. If you have energy, you have life. If you have no energy, you don't have life. In our world, money is an exchange unit of energy. The more money you have, the more life you can have. The less money you have, the less life you can have. It's a very simple logic of, of energy, okay? And then I say, well, then look about it this way. You know your checkbook has your life savings in it. And you say, okay, you can walk down the street and I could give away checks. I could say, hey, Nav, that's a great baseball hat you got. And here's $5 because you're, I like your hat. And, and oh, here, Mary, you know, that's a wonderful smile. Here's six bucks for you and I'm writing checks. <laughs> I'm writing a check, giving away money to what? Just because it, it was nice. You know, here, have some money, have some money, have some money. I say, you can't do that. If you do that, you're going to die. Why? Because yeah. you're going to run out of money, and money is what keeps you alive, because that's energy. So yeah. I say, oh, wait a minute then. I say, well, then here's a very important part. If I give you a checkbook for energy, not a checkbook for money, but for energy units in your body, and I say, I think you would be very much cautious about where you're going to write your checks to, because as you give up energy from your body, you're giving up your life. Giving up money, you're actually giving up your life, but you don't see it that way so much. But people are very cautious. They don't write checks for anything. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. If I get a return, I'm yeah. going to write a check. So the idea is this. My energy of my life, which governs every aspect from waking up until falling asleep, if I start to squander that energy... By putting it out, but not getting anything back, it's exactly the same as writing a check and saying, here, you can have this money. I go, so the whole idea is this. If I did give you an energy checkbook and, and then you say, oh, I'm supposed to go do this. And I go, okay, get ready to write a check. And the point is this. If you start to write a check and you think, like, do I want to spend money on this? Do I yeah. get anything back? Yeah. And that was the point. You know, like people go into a bar and they'll start drinking, then they'll get into a political argument. And they'll yell and they'll go blah, 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 blah. And they get mad and everything. And at the end, they say, okay, screw it. I'm going home. And they walk out of the bar. And I say, well, you just spent a lot of energy. What did yeah. you get? Did you change anything? No. Did you just waste the energy? Yeah. Well, then take the money out of your pocket and give it away because that's exactly what you just did. And the whole idea is this. Energy is life. Life activities use energy. We're very cautious when it comes to dollars and cents because there's numbers that you can see. But I'm talking about, well, there's energy and there's equivalent of dollars and cents. <laughs> and if you lose this energy, you've lost the power. Yeah. Because energy powers you. And, and so, therefore, it really got me to start thinking about, am I doing things that return my energy? Am I doing things that just spend energy and it never comes back in any form at all? And all of a sudden, I start to recognize, well, what did it do? I started cutting those lines. It was like, why should I do this? Let me think. What am, I'm just going to waste my day. I'm going to do this. Uh, the first one, actually, I always remember because the first instant of, well, I was thinking about all this. Uh, I was in the faculty in my office, uh, and one of the other faculty members came in. Uh, Bruce, uh, uh, remember, the faculty party is on Saturday night, and you know uh, we expect to see you here at this party, blah, blah, blah. And my head was going, oh, crap, one of those things. I hate yeah. those things. You just have to sit there, pretend you're really interested and engaged and stand around, do some BS with people, and then and then go home. And I thought, nope, I know it's officially a, that, you know, it's, you know, socially responsible as a faculty member to go to a faculty party. Mm -hmm. But at this moment, I said, no, uh, I'm sorry, I can't go. I, I have some other plans that I didn't realize, blah, 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 I can't go. And he walked out. 
And when he walked out, I felt this surge of energy just come in and we go, oh, I got Saturday night for me. <laughs> what the heck I want to do on a Saturday night. And I, that moment was, it was so energizing that I immediately started saying, okay, what else? What else can I cut out? Because every yeah. time I cut out one of those responsibilities that doesn't return anything, I have just made money. I could have been working. I could. I just made money. Why? I'm not spending that energy on them. I can now spend it on me. Yes. And that's what the whole idea was. Take care of yourself. But if you give away your energy with no return, it didn't change anything, didn't help anybody, especially you, why'd you do it? The investment of thoughts. The biggest thing I really took away from that, the energy checkbook, is even watching my own thoughts. Eckhart Tolle, he says, watching the thinker. When when thought frequencies come into me that could be negative, that could be saying something negative about someone else or about myself, if I think about writing a check to myself, that's a negative number, you know? Absolutely. And that's, that's a great way to be able to kind of channel your thoughts towards richer thoughts. Richer thoughts attract Absolutely. richness from the universe. So... That was one of the biggest things. Uh, there was a, a quote that you love from Bhagavan Das. It's worry is a form of praying for something that you don't want. And this is something that's yes. important because worrying is also a form of investing your thoughts towards something you don't have control over. And that's where, you know, every every morning after I meditate, I always pray, allow me to um, learn to control what I can control and allow me to let go and trust the universe with the things that I can't control. And to be able to create a line where, I'm focusing on the things I can control and I'm letting go of the things I can't really help. And I feel like one of the biggest ways to sum all this up is relationships. One of the biggest things that we can, I take away from this conversation is something Oprah said. And this is before her show blew up and before she became a billionaire or a millionaire. They were talking about, hey, your shows might be successful. Like, what if it's not? And she, she basically said, my value is determined by how I treat myself and how I treat other people. So regardless of how this show does, I think if I can learn to always value myself, if I can learn to always value people, I think I'll always do something great. And I think I'll be just fine. And one of the biggest conclusions that I've learned in my life thus far is relationship with self is relationship with the external environment. And it is the same as the relationship with source or universe. It's all one thing. So yeah, it'll affect the way you make money too. And self-mastery, self-love, Constantly looking for weaknesses that I could turn into strengths, looking at the program and knowing that I can reprogram, being honest and open with the parts of myself that I can work on, uh, and having accountability and responsibility for that. What I've realized over time is that is an excellent way to manifest. And I mean, it wouldn't be possible because I wouldn't be speaking with you. You're one of my greatest heroes. And I learned a lot of these principles from you. Well, I knew that uh, from the moment I started changing. I said, wait, I can change these things. That was the first time. It's just like, why am I following this conventional belief system that doesn't support me? Why, yeah. why, do, why do I have to wear a necktie to a lecture? That is like, what the hell? You want a noose around your neck and tighten your <laughs> neck? It's like, no. I wear Indian clothes because they're so much more easy and relaxed. Uh, 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 and the idea about it is because... Maybe convention isn't where you want to be. I do love the way that we connected all that. I did want to discuss the power of gratitude and how it's linked to epigenetics and telomeres. Could you tell us a little oh. bit more about that? Yes. Uh, uh, telomeres have come up and people have heard the word, but they really don't know. There's something about the DNA, whatever the hell it is. And, and I'll tell you what telomeres are. DNA is a double helix. It's twisted in a double helix. I go, well, fine. I say, why is, where's the problem? I say, if it unwinds, and the DNA is free strands, there are enzymes designed to knock out free DNA. So if your DNA unwinds, uh, enzymes will start to eat up the DNA, which is uh, your programming, okay? So uh, uh, then basically telomeres are at the end of the DNA, like on shoelaces, there's a little plastic thing on the end to hold all the, the you know, the cotton threads from unfolding. Uh, so you can't put it through the little tiny hole, you know. Uh, and so that's called an aglet. But that's the equivalent of a telomere as well, uh, uh, in the sense that the telomere is holding the DNA from uh, uh, unfolding. That's one, but that's actually the small part of the job. The other part of the job is this. Um, let, let's just say uh, this is a, a DNA molecule. Let's say I put my arm here. DNA molecule, okay? And I say here's an enzyme that's going to copy the DNA 
for when I reproduce the cell. I got to copy it. So uh, you split the DNA double helix into two, and then on each strand, an enzyme moves down the strand like a train on a track, copying the DNA behind it. So imagine my arm is the, uh, the engine on the train, moving down the railroad track, DNA. I get to the end of the DNA. I've copied everything back here, but guess what? I can't copy the last piece I'm sitting on because I'm sitting on it. Why? Because if the next move, it pops off. So yeah. I said, oh, wait. Then when I just copied the DNA, I couldn't copy the last little piece of the DNA. Why? Because if the enzyme's sitting on it, it has to pass over it. And if yeah. it passes over, it falls off. So it's gone. So I say, well, then this little piece of this piece of DNA is no longer there. Now the DNA is shorter. Yeah. And every time I copy it, it gets a little shorter. Mm -hmm. Well, so nature prepared by making extra length of DNA at the end, knowing you're going to clip a piece off every time you copy the DNA. Originally, they thought the telomeres were fixed. And then mm -hmm. they counted how many cell divisions you can have before you lose the telomeres. And yeah. they calculated, and it was called the Hayflick number. Uh, Leonard Hayflick, the scientist who counted this, said that we should live to be about 90 years old. Well, what a coincidence. That's just the number of age that we say that's how old we live. And then they said that's because the telomere runs out at about age 90. And anything you copy, remember, we're losing cells every day, so we have to replace them. And yeah. every time you copy that stem cell, it gets a little shorter. And they said, that's what aging is all about. And so there was a belief that your age is already predetermined. Yep. But then there's this woman, Elizabeth Blackburn, yeah. who started looking and finding that there were enzymes also associated around the telomere. And these enzymes have the name uh, telomerase, telomerase enzyme. Its function is to make longer telomere. Wait a minute then all of a sudden life isn't determined by the length of the telomere because now I can make a longer telomere and live longer. Yep. I go, oh, so there's no limit on this at this point. No, there's no limit on, on this. But there is, uh, the limitation comes in the enzyme telomerase that extends that, D, you know, that DNA telomere works under some conditions and doesn't work on other, on other conditions. Okay. It works, basically, I can divide it very simply this. If you love your life and you want to have a lot of life, the enzyme will kick in and make more DNA, telomere. Yep. But if your life is troubled, stressed, threatened, violent, you know, not working out the way you want, uh, that your, your subconscious is going, I don't want to live this life anymore. Uh, you know, it's not working. I'm, I'm getting beaten up by my mate or I'm losing at the job and my life is on the bottom and blah, blah, blah. And you're saying subconsciously, you're going, I don't want this life anymore. Well, yeah. subconscious is controlling the enzyme. So if you are living a life of struggle, hardship, violence, uh, uh, you know, just a threatening of life where it's like, I don't want this versus a life of I am so happy. I'm in gratitude. I love my life. I can't wait to have more life. I have something to do. That's a really big one. In other words, if you have a mission, your feedback is I can't end now. I'm on a mission. So mm -hmm. you will activate the enzyme way. I'm not ready to end. But when people retire and they go, I got nothing to do. I, you know, I used to do all this work, but now I'm doing nothing. What's the feedback? You're done. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this is why people, when they retire, many of them die very quickly afterwards. So the idea is very simple. You want to be alive consciously or do you want to die subconsciously? There's a big difference between those two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and the subconscious one will win. Uh, when you have no vision of, I love my life. If you don't love your life, then you don't have to be here. Fine. The system says, fine, we'll end. We've got no problem. Uh, and, and then it will end. So living in joy, gratitude, positive thinking. Yeah, I've got something really great I'm doing. I'm working on this and I'm receiving love and I'm taking care of my health which is another word. If you're taking care of yourself, you're saying what? I want to be here longer. So exercise, diet, all this. This is a, when you're doing this with a conscious mode of I love my life, then you're enhancing your telomeres. So a telomere is like a fountain of youth. Yep. If it runs out, youth is gone, game over. Yep. But if you have that joy of life and doing what you're doing and you love your job, you love your family, you love your community, you're going to activate that enzyme, and now you will be in that fountain of life, you know, the uh, fountain of youth, because you're going to stay 
younger because the telomeres are going to be made because of the enzyme. But if you lost the purpose, value, and reason for life, the enzyme stops working, and then the life ends. So all of a sudden it says, yeah, we're, we're, we're so damn creative, and we've always been programmed to believe that we're just victims. It's like this is the wake-up call of everything that we've been talking about today. That, that, uh, and this is, again, my deepest appreciation, because as you relate this to each person that you're in physical contact with, the people that are dealing with you, you are changing their lives to enhance the quality and character of their lives. In the end, all of us could live most likely 150 is the minimum. Wow. How, how long after that? Biology accepts 150 is that's the baseline. But we wow. could go longer than that. But collectively, we program ourselves out of existence here. We lost the reason yes. for being here. Why are we here? And the answer was, well, when you fall in love, you know why you're here. <laughs> because yeah. it's heaven. It's heaven. We create. And, and I, let me emphasize this. This is really important before I close on it. Mm -hmm. Does the honeymoon effect actually have to happen because you fell in love with a person? I say, no. Anything that excites your life that you love and you can't wait to do it, painting, gardening, cooking food, I don't care what it is. If you get so into it because I'm enjoying what I'm doing, that is what causes the telomeres to, to grow longer. That is what causes you to have the love experiences that allows you to be more of yourself, the red pill version. Uh, uh, and that's what we're here for. And so. Amen. And, you know, just to sum that up for our audience out there. Um, poor nutrition, child abuse, domestic violence, loss of love or no self-love and not having purpose, they can limit your life, which makes intuitive sense. And then positive, uh, good nutrition, exercise, happiness, gratitude. You love life so much you want more. Uh, self-love and living in service, having a purpose. Those are things that can prolong life. When yes. you look at the immune system, it works the same way. Those positive things make the immune system work more positively. The negative, increase in cortisol, increase in stress hormone, more fight or flight, immunosuppression. So it's, it's kind of fascinating, this entire design we've been talking about, because it comes back to the same thing, which is love. I think I'm going to be forever fascinated by this creation that we live in and the fact that it's governed by such a thing. I, I just want to thank you for taking the time and effort to be able to come on our podcast. We really appreciate you. I know our viewers and listeners, they're going to, they're going to gain a lot from this one. Well, I want to thank you again because the whole point was this. Uh, keeping this knowledge to myself doesn't help anybody, including myself. To help myself, I even have to help you. Why? Because if you're in my field, you're in my heaven or my hell. Uh, wow. And so I want all those people around me uh, yeah. to be operating from the, the heaven guidelines because if they're loving their life, then I am in a wonderful zone of where love and happiness abounds. Thank you so much. Bruce Lipton, I have one last question. This question we ask everybody who's ever been on our podcast, and that is when you first heard the word medspiration, what did it invoke? What was your definition of medspiration? That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I go, oh, wow. You know, it's creative. I love that. I love it. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and I'm really so glad you're doing it because um, the conventional belief about medicine holds uh, that it, we're victims. And uh, it's really time for us to say, no, your health is in your hands. Your future is in your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, you are creating this, and you don't know it. And, and that's why, again, uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, says. If you can let go of all the BS that people gave you over the years that you're still holding on to, and you can let it go, you have cleaned the slate. You are free to operate from there. But if you are still anchored by those things in the past, you are being held back. And therefore, letting go, forgiveness, is the most important thing we can do because recognize they didn't know what the hell they were doing either because they were programmed. There you have it, folks. I hope you guys left this one feeling med-spired. If you learned something new or if you genuinely enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and rate it five stars. Medspiration is a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization. The more you help us grow, the more people we're able to help. Let's make a commitment together, guys, and attempt to live a healthier lifestyle, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And as always, you know what time it is. 
It's time to get out there and do something med-spiring.